Thank you for listening to Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Buffalo What's Next is on summer break and we'll return with new content shortly. As we take this break, please continue to tune in to WBFO Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. and 9 p.m. for producer picks of some of our favorite episodes of Buffalo What's Next. How can we afford not to talk about race? About education. About segregation. About humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps Market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. On today's episode of Buffalo What's Next, Summertime Producer Picks, we highlight two segments from previous shows. Jay Moran speaks with the director of Buffalo City Ballet, Marvin Askew, from November 28th of last year. Then, we continue with Jay Moran as he speaks with the clinical assistant professor in the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Buffalo, Dr. Jason Corwin, from November 30th of last year. The two talk about various issues, including the launch of the full Indigenous Studies Department at the university. First, we revisit Jay Moran's conversation with Marvin Askew from November 28th of last year. Hi, Marvin. Hi, how are you? Great, and thanks uh, for coming in and, and joining us. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of elements to this that are, that are interesting. I want to get into the City Ballet and what you guys are doing and who you teach. But I want to talk just a little bit about your personal story to start things off here. Take us back to a teenage Marvin Askew and how he ended up getting into to ballet. Teenage Marvin Askew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I started dancing at uh, Clinton Junior High School um, at that time. Uh, well, now it's called uh, Buffalo Performing Arts, but um, Clinton Junior High. Um, I was a you know, 13, 14-year-old kid. Um, that had no rhythm whatsoever, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's the honest truth, you know. Okay. Um, wanted to play basketball, you know. Um, we had a couple guys that were, the, you know, at that time were superstar, and I, you know, I wanted to be like them. And um, I was told, you know, I, could, I couldn't dribble very well. I couldn't shoot very well. And so I was told, well, if you know, you take dance, it will help you out with your footwork. Okay. You know. And then I had people who was telling me, yeah, yeah, you know, just like the the football player, you know, like Lynn Swan, you know, from you know P- sure. Pittsburgh Ballet, you know, and you know he, he was taking secret ballet lessons and it helped him with his his athletic ability, you know, with the team. So I figured, okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, you know. <laughs> so me and fourteen year fourteen other boys, you know, from the community went went uh, went there, um, and we were taking class, um, and then we got in there and. And then you went life. to Buffalo City Bu- Ballet. Um, no, or, or at, at this school. time, this it, school. it wasn't Buffalo. Yeah, okay. it was just a, at the school. But the the uh, instructor, who was Carl Singletary, at that time um, was developing, you know, the Buffalo Inner City Ballet. I gotcha. And um, so he would bring, you know, his young female dancers, you know, to the you know to the um, school with him, you know, as you know where they would. Um, he would use them as examples, you know, to, to demonstrate what the movement is, and then we would have to follow them, you know. And then, of course, you know, we were like, "Wow, these, you know, these beautiful young, you know, black girls, you know, who, you know of course, all, you know, fourteen of us, you know, like <laughs> fighting over, we, I'm gonna get to meet that one, oh, sure, no, you sure, know, sure." And um, so, you know, we'll get into the stretch class, and you know, just you know, being on the floor working out with the young ladies, and you know. Uh, I started realizing that this is something that I can do. And um, so as the you know time went on, I became very skilled in terms of partnering and um, learning how to lift the girls, how to turn them the proper way, you know, how to hold them on balance. Did you, you know? have any interest in ballet before this? No, none whatsoever. <laughs> and probably most of your friends didn't either. No, no. Okay. <laughs> You okay. know, um, <clears throat> but like I said, you know, we would get in there, you know, and uh, so the instructor would tell us, you know, you know, just think of you got a basketball in your hand and you, you know, and you, you know, and you switching from side to side, you know, learning how to work the balance of the ball. Well, you have to do the same thing with the girl. Wow. So we put our hands, you know, between the girl waist. So if it's too far right, you got to pull her left, you know, so realize, oh, OK, it's just, you know, the same mechanics. You okay. Know? All right, interesting. And um, you know, so we, you know, um started doing that and I became very skillful in, in that. So whenever I got it a chance to 
partner up with a girl, you know, it was easy. I would get in there and start spinning her and kept her on her center and, you know, and so every time, you know, a production or something like that would come up, I had the young ladies coming to me. Oh, you know, you know, they'll stand next to me because they wanted me to be their partner because they realized that you could do I, it. Yeah, I could, yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, and uh, so that's when I, you know, I realized, okay, uh, I can do this. And um, and after a while, you know, you know, I was getting um, invites from various schools that were willing to have me come in to dance with the girl, and they would pay me five hundred to a thousand dollars, you know, for a weekend to perform. And I realized. Oh, I can make some money at this, you know. Right. Uh, you know, instead of me being at the local supermarket, you know, carrying somebody bag of grocery for a few bucks. Right. You know? And so, and just just to take us back then, so we're talking about in the seventies in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. What was life like for a teenager uh, who was growing up in the city of Buffalo? Uh, it, it was rough. I grew up in um, Tauber Mall at that time. That's on Jefferson and um, Clinton, and. Uh, there was a lot of gang violence, you know, um, not like you see today, Okay. you know, but we had them too, you know, where that, um, you know, young, you know, black males running around with guns and stuff like that. Um, it, it was, it was the threat of shooting you, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, no one ever really pulled the trigger, Gotcha. <laughs> you know, so compared to now, you know, um, um, it, the, and, far as you know gun violence you know um you know you had young gun mem uh, gang members you know if they were fired the gun most likely they were firing up in the air you know to scare you <laughs> right you know and but even at that time the just the the thought you know um and uh, so I, I i made a uh pledge to myself if i ever have the opportunity to um leave that situation i'm going to you know and so uh, through dance was the, the, the best way, you know. And um, I, after um, graduating from high school, I um, won several scholarships to American Ballet Theater in New York City Ballet and took the, those opportunities to go to New York and study, you know, even further, you know, and being in the same room like, uh, the same classroom with superstars like Mikhail Brishnikov and oh. you see Rudolf Nureyev or, you know, uh, Fernando Bujonas, you know, you were just like, wow, you know, I want to be like that, you know. So then I start doubling my class, you know. So I was taking anywhere between um, two to three classes a day, six days a week, you know, mm -hmm. just to get to close to that level, you know. How uh, how many black men were 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 training to dance back then? Um, not many. And if you were black and you were in dance, you know, you were often pushed to, um, to go to dance of Harlem, you know, oh, okay. at that time in the seventies with, with either dance of Harlem or Alvin Ailey, you know, and those are the two major black dance company out of New York. And so if you were black, you either went to one of those two, right. you know, uh, but because of my style of training, the Russian training, you know, and I had all these Russian instructors, you know, and uh, so I felt that I could compete with most white dancers with, in terms of white companies. So I didn't want to be targeted, you know, just because you were a black dancer, you had to go there. Sure. You know, sure. So, which I did audition for um, um, Dance of Harlem and. Um, the director, Arthur Mitchell, told me, basically, uh, you know, we, we you know, I have to retrain you, you know. <laughs> and I was like, you know, at that time I didn't understand exactly what he meant by retraining me. But I think he meant retraining me for that particular style that he wants me to perform with that company. And, uh, and I felt, well, my training was better than that style of dance. So... I'm gonna take my chance with, um, with one of the major white company. So, uh, from that Friday, you know, audition with Dancer Hall, I went to uh, Pittsburgh and auditioned that Monday, and got the job there. And so then I knew, you know, and felt comfortable where I was in terms of, you know, my style of training. So you spent a lot of time uh, professional as a professional full time ballet dancer in Pittsburgh. Yes. So uh, it, obviously, I was the first black member of Pittsburgh Ballet. Wow. At, you know, and even that was rough, you know, because what I realized was that, you know, 
even though you were good, you weren't going to get the opportunity. Now, I did get one good opportunity uh, um, where the the we were doing the um, L.A. Ailey River, and the lead dancer, you know, principal dancer, um, had a foot injury. And so it, they didn't know what to do. So all the dancers were like, oh, wow, because you needed somebody who was a jumper and a turner. And I, I possessed both of those skills. So a lot of the dancers were like, well, you know, let Marvin do it, you know. And, you know, so um, the, the uh, um, director of the company at that point in time, Pet Wild, go, mm, no, you know, hmm. <laughs> because, you know, the whole thing, you know, in terms of being black, you know. So the 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 the, um, the person who came in to set the the production um, just kind of spanned, looked around the room, and said, "Okay, this is what I need. Who can do this?" You know. So, um, so myself and about three other guys, you know, um, took the part, and and at the end, she goes, "I want him to do it." You know, so I got to do the lead, nice. <laughs> and uh, you know, and got very good reviews in the paper. You know, and it wasn't until the you know, and I realized, it was, um, in terms of the director, she wasn't quite happy with it. You know, but she accepted it. You know, <laughs> but that's all that counts. You know? so, so you you have a, a nice career going there, but you're you're commuting, you're you're spending your, your uh, weekdays and weeknights in Pittsburgh, but your family's back here in Buffalo. Buffalo. Yeah, and I would I would drive home every weekend, you know. So after unless they're you know um, a week of production, you know, I would drive home every weekend, um, leave a, um, right after Friday night rehearsal, back in Buffalo within you know four hours, and then I would get up. You know, early that Monday morning, drive oh. back, you know, <laughs> get back, you know, in time of, you know, the first class and rehearsal, you know, by 10 o'clock. Wow. You know? And I did that for a couple of years, you know, and uh, it, was, it was rough. <laughs> yeah. You had to make a, a personal professional decision then. Yeah. I had two. two uh, actually, at that time, I only had one son. Um, so I had to make a decision, you know. And um, so I felt, well, I need to come back home, <laughs> help raise him, you know. And w- during that, that time period, I got a, uh, received another contract from Missouri Valley, you know, and they were willing to hire me as a principal dancer. And then my wife realized, okay, she's pregnant again. Wow. <laughs> you know? Wow. So I had to make a choice, you know, take that contract or family. So I decided the family was over over the contract. You stayed here in Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's when I took over to school. Yeah, <laughs> Buffalo City Ballet. Um so what about the the Buffalo City Ballet? Uh, how many kids uh, tell me about the kids that are there. We uh when I first took over the um the school, it was a 60/40 ratio. 60 white, 40 black, you know. Um uh, over the years, you know, that has reversed. Now it's uh 90% black, you know, 10% white. Ninety uh, percent black uh, from the city of Buffalo. From the city of Buffalo. Wow. And uh, so my the thing that I'm always concerned with is is giving young um, black girls an opportunity, you know, to um, at least learn, you know, how to um, learn about classical ballet, you know, and what it takes to become a ballerina, you know, and it's, and it's rough, you know. Um, I mean, it's rough. Any African American dancer, you know, t- in terms of dance, is going to have a hard life in terms of dance, unless you have someone that is that's going to take you under your wing, and you know, and even if not just black dance, but even if you're 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 white, you okay. know, um, the most successful dancer always have someone that is is backing them financially, you know, because you can't really live off. What you know, your basic salary, you know, um, you know, so um, you're gonna ha- you need someone that's um, that's gonna get you to and from all audition classes, pay for your accommodation, you know, um, you know, up until you uh, become either a soloist or a principal dancer, you know. But even I, I see with even a lot of core member dancers, you know, um, 
they're from very wealthy families who's paying <laughs> their rent still and paying, you know, or they're contributing to, you know, the, the ballet companies and then return those ballet companies, keep them on payroll. Okay. Because of the contribution they're getting from those families. Wow. You know, so that's, that's a l- something that happens quite frequently. So, know, that, so. Uh, that's not generally happening to your, your students then, obviously, no, right? No, no, no. Yeah. You know, what um, but what I provide for them is, you know, pretty much tuition free, you know, so they can come and take class, you know, um, basically at no cost at all. You know, uh, what little fee that I may, you know, charge, you know, is, is maybe for like point shoes um, to cover those costs or um, keeping costume clean or having, you know, to provide new costumes or, you know. Right. Um, but what they learn, you know, is basically, you know, how to work together, you know, um, building up their self-esteem that, yes, I can do this. We don't turn away. I mean, excuse me. Even if it's a child that has a weight problem, we don't turn them away, you know, because we want to build, you know, um, like, you know, even their self-esteem up to feel that I can do this, too, you know. And, you know, and do you see that? I mean, do you see that then out of uh, these these young women? Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see that that, that they're getting, they're, they're there's a change in them. Like yeah, you said, maybe if, if there's a weight problem involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, if I mean, even <laughs> I have a few come in and, you know, we go and put them in a, a, a tutu and we go, okay, that tutu is not going to close, you know, because this is no, so we have to design something uh, what we call an insert in the back of the panels that widen out so that that child can fit into that costume, you know. So you have to be creative. Right. <laughs> Where that a lot of schools not going to do that. Gotcha. You know, because uh, you find if, a way. If, if you don't fit the costume, if you don't fit that, that mold of what a dancer should look like, they're not going to look at you or consider you. Wow. You know. So they're getting yeah. opportunities through your school. Yeah, yeah. You know. That's excellent. Yeah. Marvin Askew is our guest uh, this morning. He is the executive director of the Buffalo City Ballet. Uh, you got into it there a little bit about self-esteem, but in, uh, and we cannot kind of inter- uh, kind of guess at the, the physical benefits of being able to, to dance and stretch and the flexibility. But what about the art of it? How can you describe that and what a student would get from understanding how to perform ballet? Well, you, you, what you get is, uh, for example, um, you know, ballet is a syllabus, you know, so every, you know, every step has a name. And, you know, so you have to learn how to execute that step, you know. And so what I try to drive into each child is that, you know, if you know the basic uh, and understand the syllabus, everything else will work itself out, you know. So, and I'll use this, you know, like, um, I, I often, you know, start off with the first thing they walk in the classroom is learning what a plie is, you know. And, you know, so I would tell them plie, plies mean bending of the knee. Now, you don't have to be a dancer to understand. I mean, everybody Everyone is, you know, through their life is doing what we call a plie. You're going upstairs, downstairs, okay. you're bending your <laughs> knees. You know, you're walking, you're bending your knees. Right. So it's just your, your placement, you know. So you have five basic positions that you have to learn. And you learn those five basic positions. And within, you know, if you take the first position, it's, it's basically, you know, heel to heel with your toes expanding outward from, you know, from your body. You stand straight up. Bend your knees. Try to bend your knees, but don't take your heels off the floor. Now you're in a half plie. Now, take your heels off the floor and go all the way down. You're in a full plie. You know. So it's 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 getting them to understand that and every what every movement means, you know, tendus, you know, means to stretch. So you're stretching your legs from your hip bone all the way down to your toe without bending your knees. You know. And when kids learn all, you know, how to execute those steps, you know, and, you know, and I go through it with them um, every day, you know, I see them, you know, and I test them on that, you know. 
And before we even start actually doing the movement, you know, what does this mean? You know, and they got to tell me right off, you know. You know, you seem like such a such a nice, easygoing guy. I have this hard time picturing you being this demanding ballet instructor. Well, how how well how would you describe your, your instruction? Well, I, you know, I I I'm more of a father figure. Okay. <laughs> you know, with the kids, you know, because they, they I mean they they call me Mr. Marvin. All know? right. Over the years, it's always Mr. Marvin, Mr. Marvin, <laughs> Mr. Marvin. You know, and um, but um, I and, and sometimes I have this look. You know, I would go in and I would look them like. Like a, like a father, like what are you doing? <laughs> you <sorry>. know, <laughs> you know, just give them that look, like, ah, uh, no, 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 and then they look at me like, I'm sorry, and then they they'll they throw out what the what it really means, and say, like, right. okay, I thought you knew what that stuff means. Why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so and so that's the way I you know I kind of operate. Sure, you know? sure. And, you know, and was that how case, your teachers were? Um, no, I I know I had these little old Russian teachers that look at me and I go, "You're never going to be anything." <laughs> <laughs> and so I would look back and I'm like, "Yeah, okay, I will prove you wrong," <laughs> you know. But that's the you know that's over the years how, you know, I mean, back in the 60s and 70s, they were just pure mean teachers. Wow, <laughs> you know, and their job was you know they walk in the classroom was, okay, what young lady I'm gonna make cry today. Wow. You know, and that's the way they operate. Wow. You know? So you always have some, some ballerina cry, you know, and as a guy, we used to go in the classroom and go, all right, who's going to be the day? Take bets. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But that's the way, you know, but, you know, over the years, things have changed. You you know, you can't be that way with kids. Right. You know, I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I, I often say this is a Sioux nation. Everybody ready to sue you, you know, if, you know, uh, cruelty, you're being mean, you, right. you know. So I try to find, you know, and I don't know if I, maybe I mellowed out over the years, you know, after having kids and, you know, and now grandkids and, you know, realize, you know, that, you know, you got to find a way to reach them without being mean, right, you know. Right, right, So I would go into classroom and, you know, I get my point across to the kids, but then at the time I make it very enjoyable for, for them to be in the classroom, you know. And um, I mean, I, I get down on the floor and I act sometimes just as silly as they do. But then I got to read them back in. Okay, let's get serious now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, you know, um, you know, they're, they're you know they're ready to run up to you and hug and you know, especially now after the pandemic, I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, 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 and being right. older and you know, so um, you know, I try not to get too close and you gotcha. know, and. Gotcha. Um, and then as a, a, a male teacher now, you know, with all the things that's going on in the country, you know, you, you know, it used to be a time where you're in the classroom and you could touch the student, you grab the legs and put your legs up and everything, you know, you can't do that now. Gotcha. You know, um, whenever I'm instructing, I'd never shut the doors. Parents could come in and see exactly how I'm working with the kids. You know, I'm not screaming at them. I, you know, I make it very joy, joyful for them, you know, to be there. Um, and I don't touch, <laughs> you know. Um, and I used to have this intimidating stick that I used to thump on the floor, but <laughs> I don't even use that. You moved on from that. <laughs> yeah. Well, how many how many boys uh, are you typically teaching? Well, right now I have two boys. Okay. You know, I at, um, up until the pandemic hit, I had about five boys that I was working with, and we went for uh, almost two years of no classes, so shutting mm. down, and you know. Uh, most of the kids have, you know, gained weight or, you know, the boys are, are older now and, um, you know, are not kind of into um, different things. And, you know, and now they, you know, don't want to do it because now they fell behind. Well, you know, like pretty much all the kids, you know, and I think that not just, you know, our school, but I realized in terms of a lot of other schools, dance schools in the area, lost a lot of students. Sure. You know, because of the pandemic, you know, and kids that were doing very well, you know, set out almost two years. And th that's the one thing about dance. You can't sit two, two years out. Right. You know, you, there's just no way you can come back and, you know. And you said you, you were taking two or three classes a day when you were yeah. in New York City. Right. So, yeah, right. That, what you have to do if you're going to, to stay with it. Right. What about, uh, all right, so I'm a, I, I have a son in the city of Buffalo. And he's looking for something to. I want 
my son to have an activity to do. And I'm thinking, I'm probably not a lot of fathers are thinking of a ballet. What are you telling them? What, what, what are you telling those parents? Well, you know, like the, 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 I have some fathers that came in and, you know, and asked, you know, um, and, um, but they're not sure because, um, it's still that stigma that you have to, you know, break, you know, in terms of when it come down, dancing doesn't make you gay. <laughs> you know, I went through that for many years, you know, where that, like I said, I started with 14 boys, you know, right. or 14 of us. And we all started dropping out one by one because they were thinking, you know, well, if, if I share, you know, people think, may think I am, you know, gay and, you okay, know, and, okay. and, um, and I realized, you know, dancing doesn't do that to you. You know, either you born that way or, you know, um, I have a brother that danced. He was gay, you know, and I think that kind of helped me understand the whole thing. And uh, and so uh, and I uh, recall even before I got married, I had girlfriends that I was dating and. And then also they just dropped out of the picture and I couldn't understand why, you know, I come back home and, you know, they didn't want to see me anymore. Well, they thought I was gay, hmm. <laughs> you know, so, the, so so years later after I get married, they, you know, they're asking me, oh, you know, well, I thought you were gay. That's the reason why, you know, I broke it off, you know, I was like, well, why do you think that? I mean, wouldn't it does he just ask me, Right. you know, right. but, you know. But so, that's, but that's still something that you deal with, though. That's something I still, I, I well, not, I, I but personally, I mean, no, you know, but I'm no, saying, yeah. I'm your, you now. This is you on yeah. the, the the shoes on the other foot, so right, to speak. Right, right. You now have to be, explain this to others, to, to like fathers, you right. know, who you know um, that want their their sons to take dance, but then they're like, I'm not sure, you know. Um, in in the building that we're in now, we have a um, a boxing club on the third floor. And some of the boys, you know, they come down with the interest, like, you know, I want to try, but then, you know, they're que in question, you know, that um, if, if I come down here and take class, then everybody else is upstairs going to think something hmm. different, okay. you know. Right. So, you know, and I just say to them, you know, well, just think about it, you know. Um, so, you know, if you're comfortable in terms of who you are, then you shouldn't have no problem with that, you know. Right. You know, and that's the best thing you can do, you know. Um, but um, it's still that same old problem with, with fathers, you know. Um, and once the boys get, you know, between, um, it's okay for them to take dance, you know, between three and roughly about nine or ten. But then once they get over ten, the father's no longer, you know, they uh, pull them out. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're, we're coming down to our, 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 our final moments here, but I do want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, your theater, on it's on uh, Leroy, three hundred seven Leroy, okay. uh, right here in, in Buffalo. You just moved over there. How how did the the transition go for you? Uh, it was rough. Uh -huh. uh, um, we were like I said, we were in the Tri Main. Um, one of the reasons why we moved from the Tri Main because they they brought in another ballet school in the building, and we were at odds with each other. We were basically doing the same old thing. People were getting confused, hmm. <laughs> you know. And um, and I understand, you know, uh, the owner, you know, I mean, it's business with him in terms of rent and, you know. Um, so uh, with all the problems that was going on, I said, well, I think it's time for us to move, you know. And every time I would try to come up with um, a new way of doing things, it, it got botched, you know, and some, you know, because of being hmm. in the building. So... Um, we went to 307 Leroy. That was um, basically the building was really in bad condition, you know. So I, um, the owners came in and did, you know, some basic repairs and stuff like that. Um, um, once we, we moved in, the pandemic hit, you mm. know. And so I was unemployed, you know. And all of my un unemployment check went into fixing up parts you know of the building you know interior you know in terms of the studio laying out the bars the mirrors and um on the second floor i put in a small theater it was called the inbox theater fully equipped with us i built the stage personally um put the lights up you know sound system you know 
next door it has a cafe so during intermission you know where patrons can go and have coffee or you know um, um, snacks uh, and then the kids have a game room you know so whenever they're waiting on parents or they have free time they can go up in the game room and play um, you know we uh, and then we were able to um, convert the uh, the main studio into small in terms of having small events you know for something like our Claire tea party um, you know we can rent the hall out to um, for like small wedding reception and things like that you know right. so um, they were it gave us uh, more opportunity to expand you know beyond just um, just teaching the dance you know classes to the, to kids um, now we, you know we can rent the little theater you know to uh, young um, dancers who don't have a home to perform or um, um, a lot of kids are into now they're into poetry and you know mm -hmm. so we have a, a place where if you're just starting you could come in for very few bucks you know a uh, hundred dollars two hundred dollars you know to rent the space for a week you know it's available that was jay moran with buffalo city ballet director marvin askew from november 28th of last year we'll be back with more buffalo what's next right here on wbfo buffalo is home to many historical treasures including architectural gems central terminal affected everybody everybody from the common man to the movie star walk this concourse. Beloved community establishments. They might get a glimpse to see Lena Horne. Uh, they might uh, see Dizzy or Miles Davis, uh, you know, Charlie Parker. And homes for local sports teams. When we talk about an institution, Memorial Auditorium was an institution. The WNED PBS original production, Remembering Western New York, Explore some of these iconic structures and their connection to people who live in the region. There was a time when Buffalo's Main Street was the focus of holiday shopping in Western New York. Watch Remembering Western New York now on YouTube. Hey, is this thing on? Test, test, one, two. Sounds great. Let's go. The podcast world is overflowing with more than 750,000 podcasts to choose from. But for great local podcasts, you can now go to one place, the new Amplify BTPM Pods app. Here you can discover content produced in Western New York and Southern Ontario, our own backyard. With a wide variety of genres to choose from, there is something for everyone. Listen to the best independently produced podcasts in the region anywhere, anytime. Download the free Amplify BTPM Pods app wherever you get your apps and begin exploring your local podcast community now. How does music help and heal? Find out from our amazing guests on Mindful Music from Buffalo, Toronto Public Media. Join me, Carl Schellhorn, Saturdays at 4 p.m. on WBFO, your NPR station. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And we end the show with Jay Moran with Dr. Jason Corwin from November 30th of last year. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Corwin. Hey, thank you. Good morning. Glad you know, to it's be a, here. Yeah, I know. It's a, there's. A, I'm thrilled to talk to you, and there's there's a lot of things to talk about for sure. Uh, not the least of which, though, is the fact that UB has committed to this Indigenous Studies Department. It builds on some a, a legacy, some history inside the American Studies Department, but the university decided to set aside its own department about this. I mean, talk a little bit about the background there. Yeah, well, there. There's a long history since the 70s with such luminaries that, that people may know about, like Oren Lyons and John Mohawk and Barry White, um, both of whom were from the Cattaraugus Territory, and really carved out a space for Indigenous studies at um, the request of the Native students who were there in the 70s. And, of course, that was a time when more people were getting active about diversifying the um, histories and the types of, of studies that were happening at universities. So 
fast forward to the present and there was tremendous work done by Dr. Teresa McCarthy, who's uh, a professor at UB. She's Onondaga from um, Six Nations Reserve in Ontario. And she worked with others at the university to get a grant to provide the seed funding. But UB had to agree to continue to help the process along after that initial five-year period from uh, of funding from the Mellon Foundation. So it is a significant commitment on the university's part, and it's just been a, a great opportunity for a lot of collaborations within the university and with the larger community. I, I, when you mentioned Dr. McCarthy, I've forgotten to mention also when you started, because you this is part of your bio, that you're Seneca Nation, Deer yep. Clan. Yeah. And prior to coming to UB, I served for six years as the um, founding director of the Seneca Media and Communications Center, where I was very fortunate to have a tremendous team of very talented indigenous creatives, and we were doing everything from uh, photography to videography, web design, graphic design. We had a commercial radio station, WGWE, for many years, and so we had a, a, a very robust media presence that um, continues on. And I think I saw a, a comment by you about the idea that and you connected for a certain way digital media, the production of digital media with the st traditional storytelling of indigenous peoples. Expand on that. Yeah, well, I think that all human beings, storytelling is our basic way of knowing and understanding the world. And it's, you know, particularly recognized and appreciated within indigenous cultures, but, you know, all day long, we tell each other stories about our experiences, and they're very powerful ways of uh, communicating information and, and allowing learning to take place. So a lot of times, people in the environmental education field are looking at this new digital media landscape as being something that takes people away from time spent in nature. We hear people talk about things like nature deficit disorder. Sure. And young people just growing up completely plugged into their <laughs> devices. Right. And so at one point I had the thought, well, what if we use these devices to get people more interested in nature and get them outdoors and engaging with the natural world and engaging with environmental issues? And it's interesting because you you engage in this is your prior to your work at the University of Buffalo, but you engage in a I just think this is fascinating, uh, which you you worked with some students young these are younger students on teaching them organic three sisters gardening and you again digital media played a part in this didn't it Yeah, so this was a project that I worked on in 2014 with the Cattaraugus Territory Early Childhood Learning Center and the fantastic staff there. Uh, I worked with the uh, After School 3 program, which was the older uh, students, about 9 to 11, 12 age group, and enlisted the help of a good friend, um, uh, Richard Big Kettle, and got who's well known in the community for farming as well as a lot of artistic creations. He's a lacrosse stick maker, snow snake maker, um, just a, a tremendous artisan and, and a wealth of knowledge around farming. So we got this project going behind the Early Childhood Learning Center in the field there, and a lot of people pulled together, did what was necessary for us to provide the space and the opportunity for the students to get hands-on with traditional three sisters, corn, beans, and squash gardening, but also documenting the <laughs> process from start to finish and created uh, about a 15-minute video, and we, we showed it on a loop at the art show at the Seneca Nation Fall Festival, and that was actually what led 
to me becoming the director of media and communications because there was interest in, in developing a media department for the Seneca Nation to serve the other departments as well as to serve the governmental needs of the nation. And at that point, I was already about, I think, like 20-some years into working in the media field. Sure. And, and uh, I also have to mention, of course, you, like a couple of us around here, have an old, old, old connection to, re to terrestrial radio as well. So <laughs> we welcome the kindred spirit in that regard here, Dr. Corwin. Um, it, Interested to find, oh, or maybe just to explore just a little bit more, though, the that digital media part that uh, helping to document this this project with these young people, did that spur their interest? Do you think it added to their interest in understanding gardening, understanding the natural world? I think so, because it's something that's very familiar to young people. They're what people are calling digital natives sure. nowadays. You know, I, I look at my young nephew and he's able to pick up the nuances and details of these devices uh so quickly i mean everybody sees that you you look at people and they you know calling on their grandkids to hey come help me set up my smartphone right, right? <laughs> yes of course <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it was always my thought that why don't we use these tools to get people interested and, and engaged with the natural world. Like, let's not forget about that which provides our sustenance. I mean, every we get our entire survival from even everything here, all, all these plastic pieces on, of um, the various pieces of equipment in the studio, all, all the metals and minerals that make up these various things. It all comes from the earth. But we get very detached from it, and uh, digital media, too much television watching, screen time, certainly detracts from that. But there's still a great interest, I think, in the outdoors and the environment and in some communities. And so kind of fostering a bridge between the, the um, folks who might be more tech inclined and folks who are a little more outdoors inclined and saying, you know, we can have both. It's not an either or. And, you know, the, obviously working with the, the young people, I mean, it's it's an inspiring kind of vision to, to see them taking such a part in this, and not only in the natural part, but documenting it as well and doing their own production. But your work has also extended well beyond that in the sense that you've taken on some pretty in, um, Important project, difficult, touchy community projects in Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. There was, if I'm not mistaken, a, a project that was going to build a, a water treatment plant that was going to you help to utilize, or I guess take the, the disposal water from our uh, wastewater from fracking. Yes. And then put it into the Allegheny River. Yeah. And when you know the history of how the Allegheny River has been impacted by the Kinswood Dam. I mean, they, you know, there's been documentaries left and right, the Lake of Betrayal in particular, a recent PBS production uh, detailing that story. You know, there, there's already uh, a history of not only ancient history connection to these waterways, but a recent history of the the waters being impacted and the community being very negatively and traumatically impacted. So when word gets out that there's plans to put fracking wastewater into the headwaters of the river, it set off, you know, all kinds of alarms for people in the community. And so I was fortunate to work with a lot of community members, a lot of people within the Seneca Nation. We have tremendous environmental professionals, you know, our, our conservation, uh, fish and wildlife department, environmental protection departments, um, council and executives. Everybody was on the same page about we didn't want to see this project happen. It was too risky. There, there's too many contaminants, and there was... Uh, not a clear sense from this company, Epiphany Allegheny, that was proposing this, that their technology would 
adequately remediate and remove these substances. So we collaborated with a tremendous amount of non-native folks from Cowdersport and from the general area. They would show up at the Allegheny Territory to our weekly meetings in large numbers, and we worked together to put a halt to that project, thankfully. Yeah, it's an amazing story when you look at it that way. I mean, you can understand there might be a certain portion of the non-native population, people in Cowdersport, who would have an environmental interest. But at the same time, we see it all the time, right? Business, industri- industry needs to thrive, needs to grow. There's always that element there. But when you came in, you found allies and were able to kind of coalesce and, and, and find a, a way to, to, to pr- bring a stop to this. Yeah, and it was very humbling to see just how appreciative the folks in Cowdersport who had been sounding an alarm locally, but had been getting kind of poo-pooed, like, oh, you're just, you know, uh, worrying too much. It's not going to be that big a deal. So it looked like it was this was going to take place. This was going to happen if, if this if this type of activism didn't generate. Well, basically, what happened, what alerted myself and some other folks in the Seneca Nation about it was there was an editorial put out by a group called Public Herald, which is a, a nonprofit investigative journalism outfit um, based in Pittsburgh, though um, one of the key members is born and raised in Cowdersport. Okay. And they put out a story highlighting the, the, the potential threat from this project. And we read it the day before there was going to be a public hearing about the project in so, Countersport, so uh, we scrambled. Dr. Like, Korn, are you insinuating <laughs> that there was a non-well-publicized public hearing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was the first news we had heard about. Of course, we were aware that, you know, um, fracking has been going on full force in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, it was starting to expand more into northern Pennsylvania. And, you know, there's a long history of gas and oil development in western New York, the southern tier, northwestern Pennsylvania. But fracking was still in mostly in other parts of Pennsylvania. It hadn't quite yet crept up into that area. But now that it was, and now there was this existential threat of water, this this produced and then treated water getting put into the headwaters. And the Seneca Nation has invested significantly in restoring the fisheries and making sure that the health of the Allegheny River, you know, um, what we call Ohio, the, you know, the good, the beautiful river, uh, there's been a lot invested into making it um, something that, that we're both proud of and that sustains families through through fishing it's that whole water body is recognized by the DEC as being one of the cleanest in the state so it was too precious to allow something like that to happen Dr. Jason Gor- uh, Corwin is with us here on Buffalo What's Next this morning. He is uh, the head of the uh, Indigenous Studies Department. Not the head. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, we always got to watch that. We always got to watch that, right? <laughs> we gotta, always have to know where we are on the ladder. I, I know that I know that very well. Um, but uh, if you're with the, the, the new, relatively new, this just started 2021, 2022, the Indigenous Studies Department at the University of, uh, at Buffalo. And while I'd like to talk about that a little bit more, I, I want to, you brought up something that I, I guess I, I didn't totally understand. You were talking about the Seneca Nation and their environmental efforts, their structure, a governmental structure that it sounds like it's in place to help focus on these issues. And you're seeing the impact of the Allegheny River. Just tell me a little bit more about that. I guess I'm almost interested in a discussion. Are, Are there lessons that, whether it's New York State, on the federal level, that can be learned from the way the Seneca Nation handles environmental issues? Well, of course, there's, you know, philosophically a a deep concern around sustainability and our relationship with the natural world. You know, our 
you could say one of our most important um philosophical practices and spiritual practices it, re it revolves around giving thanks for the natural world um the thanksgiving address people call it in english sure and so there's there's that but in terms of the seneca nation as a modern government with various departments that are focused on particular issues and needs of the community whether it's um, elders or housing or medical you know um, drug and alcohol treatment you name it there there's a, a department focused education and so there's an environmental protection department who's very much focused on things such as um, brownfield remediation for things in the city of Salamanca or, um, you know, any number of, of potential environmental threats as well as general waste management and disposal. And we also have a conservation fish and wildlife department that's specifically focused on managing the fisheries. You know, they um, uh, run um, uh, fish hatcheries on both territories that that are run with uh, clean energy and very efficient and are for you know stocking the the fish populations as well as um, taking care of anything you know um, animal issues you know bears getting in people's trash and needing to be relocated to an area away from people or, you know, rabid animals, or an injured eagle, and making sure it gets to a wildlife rehab. You know, they're, they're out there on the ground, on the land, doing that work every day. And so many of these people are also uh, part of working groups. Like, there's a climate change working group within the nation. Really? There is uh, a watershed resources working group, which I was fortunate to be a part of when I worked for the nation. Um, so there, there's really a number of, um, committed and well-trained professionals in these areas who are, are very diligent about ensuring, uh, protection of, of the environment and the natural world on our territories. Obvi uh, there, of course, whether it's the Department of Environmental Conservation here in New York State or the EPA, lots of committed individuals in those departments as well. Yeah. But sometimes those departments and their missions can be sidetracked by politics. Do you, I mean... I Anywhere guess, it can get sidetracked by it, politics. So I guess, Universities yeah. are chock full of politics, Seneca Nation? too. Seneca Nation? Yeah, everywhere. Okay. All right. I just I, I was inter I'm interested in going there because it does sound like an expansive effort. You know, the Seneca Nation, of course, is you know um, uh, the revenues, of course, that they generate from various interests are, are well documented to a certain extent. But it's interesting to hear that there is that level of uh, of structure in place that is focused on. It, it, it seems like it's taking the tradition of indigenous peoples and bringing it into a, a very practical, modern day approach to. How to uh, how to remedy and deal with very very complex environmental issues? Yeah, this is something that I explain to people often because oftentimes in the media we're just hearing about the casino and uh, you know conflict with the state over revenue sharing over gaming compacts and that's about as far as it it goes and people don't understand that you know we have all these services that we're seeking to provide to our people. And and that has to be done, you know, somehow, some kind of way. And that's through the various um, enterprises that the nation has. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I guess it's it, we're kind of like opening up a door to a larger conversation mm -hmm. about, and maybe we can even go on that just a little bit. You, like you said, people are surprised. People don't get, the media doesn't necessarily focus. What else is the media missing or the general public missing uh, about understanding indigenous peoples in uh, at this stage of history? Well, one is that there's a huge amount of diversity throughout the Americas. And even if we're just looking in, in the context of say the Northeast, you know, um, we have different peoples with 
different histories, different languages, different traditions. And so a lot of times, because not much attention has been placed in the media on on Native peoples or in schools, we're sort of just this out of sight, out of mind entity to most people. And it's not uncommon to hear, oh, you know, they're still Indian. Oh, reservations exist. And so... So there's, you know, in a lot of ways, there's a, just a general lack of understanding of just how, how things are structured, right? I mean, I, I think when you get right down to it, right? I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's a big part of it. So s- students that that are at University at Buffalo that are fortunate to take our courses get to see the great depth and diversity of the indigenous experience, of whether it's around history or linguistics, environmental justice. You know, there's such a wide range of topics that we're teaching and and we're a rapidly growing department too we yeah how is the how is the student response to this are you are you getting uh, a good um, solid enrollment i mean again like you said <laughs> universities are political animals too but yeah how about the how's it working yeah it, it's been increasing uh every semester and you know i i can speak for myself that in terms of seeing the student reviews the anonymous student reviews at the end of the semester for the courses a few times I've had students say this was my favorite professor at UB, and they appreciate the um, passion and the commitment we because you know we we live this we care about this kind of you know the work that we do. So we have people who are in our department who are linguists, who are um, historians, who are media critics, media producers. You know it's. Um, people with anthropology backgrounds you know it's it's quite a diverse group and and it's exciting that it's growing we added two more this this semester this fall semester um we're going to be adding at least um two more in another year um we we have people that are teaching language classes uh, seneca language tuscarora language uh, mohawk is going to be offered so it's quite a robust uh, curriculum that we're pulling together. Uh, saw one a review of some work that you did, and and somebody was uh, marked about or remarked rather about your hopefulness, your hopefulness. And here on this show, we even have, you know have the, the word words what's what next uh, in that uh, in the title of the show as well. What are the possibilities? I'm going to explore that optimism a little bit here. If there was, if and I, we're going to say when there is, a greater understanding of the general American populace and Native cultures, Indigenous cultures, what are the possibilities? What 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 what, what can we hope for to come out of that? I a more sustainable and humane future that benefits all. You know, we're at this critical crossroads uh, as a species. The you know our global commons is threatened by the impacts of industry of of the various things that we consume and partake in 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 the modern world, and so it is beyond imperative that not only in in this country but around the world that there is respect and collaboration with indigenous peoples to see that we're not some quaint relic of the past. Uh, we have very viable um, ideas. We have tremendous intellectual traditions, and we very much want to be partners at the table in seeking out a sustainable future for all. So my students give me a lot of hope for the future because I see them critically thinking about these things. A lot of them are here from uh, Western New York and, and are local, and they are really opening their minds to get to know who their indigenous neighbors are. And that will do it for today's Summertime Producer Picks episode. We would like to thank our guests, Marmot Askew and Dr. Jason Kerwin. If you missed this and you'd like to hear it again, a reminder that this program is a podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts or the Amplify BTPM app. And each episode is available online on demand at WBFO.org. 
This is WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOL in Olean, and WBJ Jamestown, your NPR station. This is Charles Gilbert. Thanks for listening.